In this week's show, I interview Rainer Tu. If you have a full-time job, you're better off, you know, trading the higher time frames, whereby you can, you know, still function well at your job and you still can manage your trading. So again, lifestyle plays a big part. You trade because you love it and not because you are a slave to the markets. When you are trading, right, you're not being paid by the hour, you're, but you are being paid to do the right thing over and over again. The only way you're going to get a consistent set of results is to have a consistent set of actions. And now your question should be, how am I going to get a cons consistent set of actions? So one way you learn what works is by understanding other traders. You know, the traders basically, they are those who are profitable and those who are losing. I find that I learn a lot from losing traders, right? You realize that the reason why they are losing is because they do certain trades. And you realize why certain traders make money is because they are doing certain trades. Start small, right? Because when you are starting off your trading career, your goal is not to make a lot of money. Your goal is simply not to lose money. That is it, right? You're not even trying to make money in the first year or second year. Your, your goal is just, you know, to focus on the process, focus on, you know, getting your actions right. From the outside looking in, it can sometimes appear that peak performers have an elusive talent or skill that sets them apart from the rest of us. However, what usually sets peak performers apart isn't what they can do, it's what they will do. You are listening to the Trading Edges podcast, the podcast dedicated to seeking and sharing the best ideas and principles from peak performers across all domains of performance and achievement to help you discover your full trading potential. Hello everyone, this is Houston, and welcome to episode 25 of Trading Edges. Now, before we get started, I wanted to give you your opportunity to shortcut your trading success. Many of you may know my story and how long it took me to become a consistently profitable trader. And in the next several weeks, I will be rolling out a new coaching program called The Keys to Your Trading Business which goes into everything it took me to become a consistent trader. You see, most traders focus on just trading and miss out on this whole other aspect, and that is they neglect to run their operations as a business. So the program includes how to structure a profitable trading business, how to create not just a trading plan, plan, but a business plan. The key elements around creating the ideal trading mindset. How to create lasting behavioral change for you. The tools, resources, and routines of successful traders, as well as my favorite setups that I trade every day. I assure you, if you've struggled to put together all these pieces, this will shortcut your journey and save you thousands of dollars, but more importantly, hundreds of hours, hours which you cannot make back. So what we're going to do is if you leave us a review on iTunes, we're going to go ahead and provide one lucky person with a free copy of the Keys to Trading Business program along with one free month of one-on-one -on -one coaching with me to teach you how to trade and build that trading business you've always wanted. So head on over to iTunes and after we hit 100 reviews, we'll go ahead and pick one lucky person that will win the program and the one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I guarantee you, the value of this program will be in excess of $1,000. Now, let's talk about this week's podcast. In this episode, I chat with Rainer Tiu. And Rainer is a former prop from trader turned independent trader and blogger. And Rainer has a really compelling story. In this podcast, you're going to hear how, first how he decided to move from trading at a prop firm to becoming an independent swing trader, and how Rainer learned the, the traits of successful traders. We hear about Rainer's trend following methods and why he believes you need to get rid of the nine to five mentality when it comes to trading. 
Finally, you're going to hear why unrealistic expectations are harmful for new traders and why Rainer really thinks that um, paper trading is not all that it's cut out to be. As always, I hope you enjoy the show. You can find the show notes and resources at thetradingedge.org backslash 25. Now, on to the show. Welcome everyone to episode 25 of Trading Edges. So, on the podcast today, I have a fellow blogger by the name of Rain- Rainer Tew with me. And Rainer's a trader. As I mentioned, he has, actually has a very popular blog called uh, tradingwithrainer.com. Uh, and I think he'll, he'll find him to be a very interesting guest. He has a very engaging uh, history of trading and just a really engaging story. So, uh, welcome Rainer to the, sh- to the show today. Hello, Houston. Thank you for having me today. Of course. It's great to have you on, man. So we always start from the beginning here. So why don't you just share with us, uh, first off, how did you get started with trading? And then let's talk about you know how you actually trade afterwards. Okay. So for me, I'm, I started off trading when it goes back to my army days where, when I was, I was serving in the army because as a, as a Singaporean, we are all, I would say it's compulsory for us to serve the nation in the army. So while in the army, I had pockets of free time, right? You, you're not constantly always, you know, engaged doing physical stuff. You have your own break time and rest time. And sometimes the break can be relatively long. Hmm. So during this break, I, I knew that I didn't want to waste my time playing games. Right? So I decided to read books. And this was when I chanced upon books like investing, Warren Buffett, financial markets. So this was hmm. my first exposure of it. And I would say gradually when you see such stuff, you will be curious to learn what technical analysis is all about. So that's it. After my stint in the army, I was uh, had the, the privilege to, to further my study. So when I enrolled into university, I got into a course. I was into banking and finance. So while in university, one fine day, this broker was invited down to my school to conduct a well a so-called trading, edu- uh, trading contest. But I think it's more of a way to create awareness among students. Hmm. So I took part in the trading contest. It was a forex trading contest. And within two days, right, I, I, I blew up the entire account. <laughs> So, yeah, so this came as a, a starting point to me because, you know, how difficult could it be? I mean, trading, you're just buying and selling and within two days, I lost everything. So this basically sparked my interest towards trading specifically. So this is when I start to, you know, read all I can about trading, right? You're on forums, I was on YouTube, I was on videos, I was looking at webinars, everything to equip myself with the relevant skill set of trading. So I would say about two, three years has passed. So after graduation, I knew I only wanted a job, right, which was a job in trading. So mm-hmm. I started applying jobs in proprietary trading. That was the most relevant thing I could do. So after a few months, right, of job hunting, I managed to land in my uh, previous firm where they accepted me in. So down there, I would say that was where I basically got started in trading. Yeah. Cool. And just let the audience know, so you're based out of Singapore then, right? Is that, uh, is that correct? That's right. I'm currently based in Singapore. Cool. And so at that time at the prop firm, can I ask, so what kind of instruments did you trade at, the, uh, uh, at that prop firm? Okay. While at, the firm, while at the firm, I was primarily trading the Japanese stock market, sorry, the Japanese index, which was the Nikkei 225. Hmm. So I started off with that. Then as you progress as a trader, you started to, you know, you, you have the option to trade the other markets as well, the other okay. futures market. And... Uh, how would you describe your 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 time there at the prop firm? Was it uh, was it um, was it productive for you? Did it help you along your your trading career? Did you learn good lessons? How would you describe that? Yes, I would say it, it's a, it's a great experience. So so how my life was like down there was that I was there about anywhere. The initial stages initial stages was twelve to fourteen hours a day. It was it was long hours. You mm. are watching the markets tick for tick. And you are just learning about what works and what doesn't work. Right. So one way you learn what works is by understanding other traders. You know, the traders basically mm. they are those who are profitable and those who are losing. I find that I learn a lot from losing traders. Right. Mm. You realize that the reason why they are losing is because they do certain trades, and you realize why certain traders make money is because they are doing certain trades. So you kind of see it from a, a third party point of view, and you realize, hey, that works, and you start to develop the traits that are clearly working for the more successful traders. Yeah. So I would say it. I didn't really learn a lot in terms of technical analysis because all those, I, I learned it from the books and stuff years before. Hmm. But in terms of 
the traits of a trader, you know, in what it takes to succeed in bus- in this business, that was what I learned the most in the firm. Okay. So, because, you know, when you're around traders, right, they're good, they're bad, you really would, you know, pick up certain things along the way, the way they think, the way they react. Yeah, stuff like that. Excellent. And so fast forward. So what happened after the prop firm? So at some point you decided this is no longer for me. Um, what was it? What was the... Uh, um, you know what was the the spark for that for the change? For okay, from so the while firm? while I was at the firm, I was doing twelve fourteen hours a day, and my my goal in trading from the start was to you know to trade to trade for in a way a lot of people put it as financial freedom. But I don't want to use the word financial freedom, but rather you trade because you love it and not because you are a slave to the markets. Right. So at that point in time, I realized I was basically a slave to the markets. I, I was watching tick for tick and I realized I lost a lot of the freedom that I enjoyed. Mm. So I knew that I had to branch out into something that could fit into my own goals for trading. Yeah. So this is where I started trading off the higher time frames, trend following, swing trading. That was where I slowly branched it out, right? And yeah. at that point in time, I was also blogging already, but... Again, given that I was with the firm, there were constraints that how much you can talk about the markets. Mm. Right? You can't share what you do exactly with the firm because it would so-called, they feel that they, it would jeopardize their age. So I yeah. couldn't really write a lot. So when I finally took the step to move on myself, this was, I would say, a liberating moment because finally, you know, it, it's, 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 there, there's a risk involved, of course. But I decided to take it and see where it leads. And I'm glad you know, that things happen to fall into place today. Nice. And can I ask how long was that that you decided to, to make the leap, make the jump? I was with the firm for about two years. Okay. Yeah. And so that was, uh, how long ago was that that you left the firm? That's like two years ago? Wow. Well, let me let me think back. I think I left somewhere in early last year, early last year about oh, okay. there. Very yeah. cool. And so how did you think you got to that realization that, you know, um, that it just wasn't the right fit because you see so many traders they struggle so much with finding, you know, finding something that's suitable for them, right? So you see a lot of folks who think and believe that they need to be intraday people or that they need to be swing people or they need to be whatever, but it seems to take a lot of people a long time sometimes to figure that out. Yes, I agree, right? At one point in time, I myself thought that the only way to make money trading is to read the order flow of the market, meaning you need to see the bids and offer. That is the mm. way professional traders trade. And I was disillusioned for, for a long period of time. And I would say the biggest breakthrough came, right? When I read about traders, like the turtle traders where they trade simply using end-of-day charts. Uh, and I realized that you have to find something that suits you, right? There is no one thing that is the holy grail. There are people yeah. who make money with charts, people who make money with just the order flow, people who make money just with fundamentals. Yeah. So again, you got to find something that really, really suits your beliefs about the market and your personality. Yeah, that's well said. So why don't you share with us, so how do you trade the markets nowadays? You talked about trend following. Give us a, a little bit more on actually what you do nowadays and how you trade. Okay, sure. For me, as of right now, I like to capture trends of the weekly chart because I find those trends to be the longer lasting one. And that's mm-hmm. where the so-called big money is to be made because the trends can really last for months and even years. Yeah. So what I like to do is that on the weekends, right, when the markets are closed, I would analyze the markets. Right? I, would, I, I look at about 60 markets. And I will see which are the best trending markets at this point in time. So I will just maybe have a list, right? Maybe say, for example, right now, you say the boon market is, re- is trending really well towards the upside. I'll just put a commentary be- beside it, right? Say the boon trending well. So out of these 60 markets, there'll be probably a watch list down to about five or six markets. Mm. So out of these five or six markets, right? Before the market opened, I would, I have a trading plan. So I'll write down commentary in this Excel spreadsheet into how I would like to trade these markets, these five, six markets. Because just because a market is trending, right, does not mean that you will be in the trade because you still need to identify where you're going to enter, how much you're going to risk, where you're going to exit if you're wrong. Mm-hmm. So all this are basically in the commentary section. So for example, let's say we were talking about the boon, right? So, so I know the boon is in a trend. So the next question to me right now is, how am I going to capture this trend? Mm. Would I be trading the pullback? Would I be trading the breakout? Would I be maybe trading the retest of the, the lows? So these are certain questions that I will ask myself. And I'll look at the chart and I see which entry technique would make the most sense. Mm. So for right now, the boon is trending very well. So I'm looking at... So, so I, I forgot to mention, right? I look at trends on the weekly time frame, but I usually find my entries on the daily and four-hour time frame, the okay. lower time frame. Yeah. yeah. So I would then go down to these time frames to 
capture trends using you know one of the few entry techniques that I use. I trade primarily breakout and pullback. These two. Gotcha. And so, how do you determine what's trending? Is it just simply like you just eyeballing it and saying, "Yeah, it looks like it's in a trend," or do you use some sort of indicator like an ADX that says, "All right, that's you know whatever this value is higher than that value, so it looks like it's a trend," or do you again just draw a line and say that's a trend? Okay, I wish that's a, that's a, a really you know easy way to quantify it, but for <laughs> me, I, I define the trend par- primarily just by eyeballing the chart. Yeah. Like for example, if if a a trend is is moving from left to right, and you can see the app and flow is very clear. You see a, a move higher, you see a retracement, you see a move higher, you see a retracement. You know the trend is pretty much healthy, and these are the kind of the trends that I like to trade because it is, you can so called have certain predictability into how this market would move. Right. So I would say, even though I'm I'm trading with the trend, I'm still pretty particular about the kind of trends I trade. Right. Yeah. I typically. Yeah categorize trends into three categories. The first category is what I call the parabolic trend. So these are trends which are, you know, they're just one straight line on your chart. It's like a rocket taking off. Poof, that's it, right? Yeah. They have little to no pullback. So that's what I call a parabolic trend. It is very difficult to find entries on a parabolic trend because yeah. it moves too fast. The second type of trend that I would prefer is what I call the healthy trend. These are the kind of markets which I get my entries on. The healthy trend would exhibit, right, for example, I use the 2050 period moving average okay. to help me identify my dynamic support and resistance on the chart. So for healthy trend, it tends to respect this moving average on the chart. So you know, if it, it trades higher, then it retraces, it tends to find so-called support at this moving average before it trades higher once again, and then it retraces, it tends to find support at this moving average once again, and then it trades higher. So I like this kind of chart where the pattern is very clear, mm-hmm. right? The clearer it is, the more conviction that I have, you know, to take these kind of trades. And that's the second category of trends. And the last category of trend is what I call a weak trend. And they're just basically, well, they are in a trend technically because they have higher highs and higher lows. But the trend is very weak because their pullback is so steep. You can just take a, a fit retracement too. Chances are you will retrace to a 618 or a 786 yeah. retracement. So these are kind of the trends that I would stay out of. So yeah, these are my basically, you know, the three category of trends that I do pay attention to. Yeah, that, that, thank you so much for sharing that. I think it's, that's going to help a lot of the audience um, just begin to add some context and some quality to the types of, of you know trending markets because, like as you said there, not, not all trending markets are the same and you need yeah, to react yes, differently yes, based upon what trending market you're trying to trade. So yes, thank right. you for sharing that. That's, that's great. And so, you know, out of the, you said 60 markets that you have on your watch list, right, that you, that you watch on a regular basis? Yes. How, how many... Do you find like do you have an average of how many open positions you'll have at any given time? Is there an average or is it really, really vary based upon what's trending? Well, it's very it's very the variability is can be very wide. Because yeah. it really is like for example, when the markets start to trend, right? I my my own observation is that they will trend together. It could be because of, you know, recession in the market zone mm. and markets start getting correlated. Yeah. So it starts to trend together at the same time. And when the markets are not trending, nothing just seems to be moving. So yeah. I would say, you know, like last year, right, the, 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 the best period I had was when the crude oil collapsed, the euro dollar collapsed. Yeah. yeah, that was a good period for me because, I mean, the markets were just trending very nicely. Right. So in that instance, right, I, I have about, I would say, in terms of position, is about 15 because I, I scale in my trade. So okay. as I scale in, right, the positions keep, keep adding on. So I think yeah. at one point in time, I have about 15 to 20 positions. Yeah. And also, as of right now, where the market isn't really too favorable for me, right, nothing yeah. much is clearly trending. I have like maybe two positions right now. Okay. And then, so what's the instruments, what's the uh, instruments that you trade then? You know, I asked you this question actually before the before the recording started, but it sounds like you trade Forex, futures, what, share with yes, the audience. Okay, yeah, so what do you trade look, in your basket of, of uh, instruments there? Okay, so it's quite a bit, but I look at most of the major currency pairs. I look at the metals like gold, silver, platinum, palladium. Yeah. I look at the bond markets, the 10-year treasury, the five-year, the, the boon as well. Yeah. I look at the global indices like you know, the S&P, NASDAQ, Hang Seng, Nikkei, STI, which is my local stock market. I look at maybe the crosses, Euro Aussie, Euro Pound, hmm. Pound Aussie, Pound New Zealand. I look at the agriculture, wheat, corn, soybean, sugar as well. Yeah. So yeah, basically, I would try to get exposure into all these different sectors. Yeah, because the thing is, uh, by looking at different, by looking at a wide variety of sectors, it greatly increased the odds of me actually capturing a trend. Because right. you take, for example, a trader who just trade maybe three currency pairs, Euro Aussie, sorry, uh, the Aussie dollar, pound dollar, New Zealand dollar, and compare it with a trader who trades about 60, 70 markets. Right. Needless to say, right, I'm sure you can agree with me that the trader who trades more markets 
has a greater odds of capturing a trade compared yeah. to a trader who just trades three markets. Yeah. yeah, they're gonna have to wait around a lot longer. That's right. That's right. And so, so how do you decide then? Is it uh, do you mostly express your trades in the form of uh, like the forex pairs and the futures markets, or do you actually try to pick like an ETF to play some of these as well? Or is it always usually just fu- uh, futures contracts or or something to that effect? I use a lot of spot actually because it okay. gives me. I find that the spot has greater way to manage your risk because they can go into you know uh for example 1.5 1.7 kind of standard lot whereas the futures is pretty fixed one lot two lot is right. yeah so i like i like the forex because of the flexibility down there okay interesting and then how do you handle like the the correlation of things so like you know when you have 15 markets all trending i would imagine some of those are you know have high correlations do you, do you play them all because they're all trending and because i wouldn't they if, if they all break down wouldn't they all break down at the same time potentially yes okay for me personally i, I don't trade for example, say I'm looking at uh, the, the US dollar. Then US dollar you can pair with, I think, quite a number of currencies, right? right. I think about six major currencies. So I, I'm not going to trade all, even if, say, for example, I'm bullish on the US dollar. What I do is that, see, if I'm bullish on the US dollar, that means that I'm going to short the major currency pairs. For example, short the euro dollar, short mm-hmm. euro long USD. So what I'll do is I will analyze and ask myself, among the major currency pairs, which is the weakest one? Mm-hmm. I want to go short on the weakest one because... For me, right, when you short the weakest one, I find that it tends to go further compared to compared to shorting a market which is not as weak. Right. So for me, I like to go long the strongest market and go short the weakest market. So anything that's in between, I will not I will not trade it, right? So I usually park my money with the trends which are the strongest to yeah. see. That's okay. That's that's great that's great information. Yeah. And so I think a lot of, you know, folks are probably curious and you know uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, uh, newer listeners on the uh, who listen to the podcast as well. And a question that you know people often ask, ask is, you know, what does your trading day actually look like? So, on an average trading day, and it sounds like you take less trades than most people because you you know have a longer time frame. What does your average trading day or, or week look like? Do you, how much time do you actually spend, you know, sitting at the computer and actually you know watching the markets? Okay, so this again depends, right? So as I've mentioned. On the weekends, I, I, th- I like to do my homework because I'm, I'm distracted. From, there's less distraction. Yeah. So that would take anywhere from one to two hours, you know, planning my trades and, you know, getting prepared for, you know, the markets next week and which one I'm looking at. And then I would like to review my trades because I also journal down my trades. Every time I put on a trade, it goes into an Excel spreadsheet. I will screenshot the charts. So this is a good time for me to, to review them as well. Mm. So when the week opens, all right, I basically have an idea on how I'm going to trade the selected markets, which I've actually analyze on the weekend yeah so basically what i'll do is i will either put in the orders in the market ahead of time or if the setup requires me to wait a little more for so-called confirmation then i would wait so again if the markets are not really trending very well i typically spend about less than an hour trading each day however that is said right if the markets are trending very well like for example last year we got a collapse of crude oil euro dollar etc right yeah. this is where i would be more aggressive and i would not only trade just a daily and four-hour time frame, I would even go down to the 15 minutes and one-hour time frame to, to, to trade actively, to capture the, the strong momentum behind this move. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is where I get really more active and, you know, getting my entries off the intraday time frames. Right. So, again, it really depends on the, the market conditions. Com- yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and then and when, and, and when, the, and when, when the conditions are not ripe, then you don't try to force things, right? You're like, okay, I'm yes. just going to wait for things to, to get better and fit my model or your 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 trading plan and then waiting for that to show up yes yes that's right for me I, yeah that's right you said a good thing right? because trading is as much as knowing when to be in the markets and when to stay out of the markets yeah. so a lot of traders they do not get the portion of you know knowing when to stay out of the markets <laughs> and that's when they lose their, their their money that they made in good times and they're back to square one so yeah, yeah. so true and unfortunately for traders and I, I don't know what it is and you know if we've talked about this idea in the past with other guests but you know, traders as a whole, we seem to have a, a bias towards action. You know, like we'd rather be do, pretending to be doing something, <laughs> even though sometimes what you're doing is probably not the best thing to be <laughs> to be actually doing. Um, so I think it's all you know. It's hard sometimes just to sit on your hands and wait. And I think it yes. sometimes can bite you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure where, where I heard this from, but I thought it was a very meaningful quote. It says something like, you know, when you are trading, right, you're not being paid by the hour. You're exactly. but you're being paid to do the right thing over and over again yeah so yeah gotta get rid of the notion of the nine to five work lifestyle work hard kind of yeah, yeah approach yeah. right you 
yeah, in trading, when you're working hard, it's not, you know, firing orders into the market. It's more of uh, developing your trading style, you know, recording your trades, reviewing your trades, improving yourself at the back end part. So this yeah. is the portion where a lot of people don't see. They only see the front end where they are, you know, firing trades, you know, constantly, you know, trading the markets. But the, the behind portion, right, the back end part, I would say that is equally important, if not more important than the trading itself. Well said. And so you know you you have a, a big uh, audience from your from your blog, and you've had some good experience of the tr- of the prop firm. So where have you seen a lot of traders get tripped up in their in their you know trading careers? Is it something that they're doing that they're not doing? What what have you uh, noticed and observed? Okay, I, I would say the the biggest one that, that that I find is the lack of having a concrete trading plan. Mm. So a lot of times I see traders just coming to the markets. They look at it. Oh, okay, right. They say, oh, here looks like a good place to sell. I sell. And then the next question I ask, so where are you going to, to cut your loss? Say, oh, I'll, I'll wait and see. I mean, what is wait and see, right? You have to know <laughs> before a hit of time where you're going to get out of the trade before you even put on the trade. Yeah. So yeah, this is due to a lack of uh, having a trading plan, right? And when, when they are in profits, I say, where are you going to exit? Again, I'll wait and see. <laughs> you can't do that, right? You, you have to know exactly where you're going to get out of the trade. Because if you wait and see, right, the market goes in your favor, you get more greedy. You say, oh, another 10 more, 10 more ticks. And yeah. it go against you. You say, oh, I'll wait for, you know, go another five more ticks and I'll exit. And eventually, the trade becomes a loser because you don't have a plan to start with. Right. So I would say, you know, having a trading plan is definitely essential to, to even start in this business. Yeah, well, well said. And so just in your own journey, so... You know, you hear a lot about edges and having to have a system of the positive expectancy and all kind of stuff. But, but you know, what do you consider to be your your trading edge? Is there something that you bring to the table that's that's unique to you that's um, that's allowed you to find success with trading? Okay, for for me, my trading edges. Are you talking about maybe the the hard edge, like the trading itself, or the soft edges, like a trader's personality? Yeah, that's some... that's uh, let's do both. If you have if you have if you have some ideas about that. Okay, for for hard edge, right? I I. I... I didn't come up with, with this, right? Because again, I, I follow trend following. I yeah. read Michael Covell's book, right? So I find that a lot of a lot of it actually resonate with me. Mm-hmm. And I've seen you no know, traders like Jesse Livermore, uh, Ed Sakoda, and those billion dollar hedge funds, they're all employing trend following approach. So I know, right, since they're all doing something so similar, it has to be working, right? So yeah. I go and explore and understand you know, what makes them, what actually, you know, helps them make the money. So yeah. I realized that their age comes from having a stop loss on every trade. So basically, their downside is limited, right? Mm-hmm. They, they have a maximum position loss. And their upside is basically unlimited. Right. Why do I say unlimited? Because as a trend follower, they don't have a fixed profit target in mind. They are, they are, they are, they are not going to say, okay, I'm going to take profit at the nearest resistance, the nearest swing high. They are going to trail their stop loss until the market hits their stops. If the market does not hit their stops, they just trail their stop loss accordingly. So in other words, they really have no idea how far the trade is going to go, right? Because they basically in have unlimited profits to speak. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Like it's, you cap your losses, but you don't want to cap your upside. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So in the, if you ask me, that would say uh, that's a hard edge, right? Okay. That is something that towards the trading itself. Yeah. And for soft edges, I would say it really boils down to your personality right one thing you definitely need in trading is to have discipline right you, there is no way you are going to make it right you can have the best trading system you can have the best risk management but if you don't have discipline that's it right you 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 will not make it so yeah discipline is again something that a trader need and that is a, a very useful soft edge to get and for me i think how i got it was because in the army days right is where you have to be very disciplined mm. so that was i think i develop the you know the discipline from there and it brings on into your everyday life yeah and one way to help with your discipline or for example some of you may be interested okay Raina, how do i be more disciplined well what you can do is again discipline does not start with training itself discipline starts with your everyday life right. the moment you wake up every day make your bed sheets right if you are using the toilet and the toilet gets dirty make sure you have a weekly routine to clean your toilets mm. so this is what i do right i make my bed sheets i wash my toilets every week i hit the gyms and all this right builds up and gets you ready for the trading arena, right? Again, because if you have been disciplined all your life in everything you do, it becomes second nature when it comes to discipline in trading. Your stops are there, it's there, right? You are disciplined to put your stop loss, you set it there. You're disciplined to follow your trading plan, it's there. So everything starts with the basic fundamentals itself. Yeah, so true. You know, we bring so much of ourselves or our personalities into trading. And if, you know, we, we really can't expect to have a different version of us show up the trading and a different version of us in the real world, right? If we're yes, yes, undisciplined right. and we, we, we lack self-control 
outside of trading, there's a very good chance that's going to bleed into our trading. So I think that's really, really well said. And I, you know, one thing I see, you know, traders struggle with all the time is just this this lack of consistency in their trading. Like people, I see a lot of traders, especially the guys that I, uh, you know, some traders that I coach, is that they they kind of make it up as they go along. It's like kind of like you said with the trading plan, people are kind of just making it up during the trading day. It appears like sometimes, like they haven't thought it out all the way through that they need to actually, you know, follow this the structure or process or or plan, and they just kind of, you know, are are trading impulsively uh, during the trading day. Um, and I see that also tripping up a lot of people. Uh, any thoughts about about uh, or any any comments about uh, uh, that type of behavior? Okay, I would say that could be due to them not understanding what trading is all about. They think maybe trading is because because trading originated from the floor, right? Where where traders are basically scalpers on the floor, right? Hitting the bids, hitting the offers. So I guess when you see such things on the TV and you translate it into trading right here, right? They kind of think that, okay, on the, because on the floor, right? Those traders, they are basically trading based on how the environment is, you know, acting up right now. Are the, are the bids getting hit? Are the offers getting hit? How is the, the noise ratio kind of like? Mm. So they do, those traders back then, they don't have what I call a more concrete trading plan, right? Everything is just based on the environment they are in. But as you develop more into the this kind of trading right now where you are trading of the higher time frame you're not so fast paced you need something to actually guide your actions because the the thing is this if you are inconsistent with your own actions there is no way you're going to get a consistent set of results right the, the only way you're going to get a consistent set of results is to have a consistent set of actions and now your question should be how am i going to get a cons- consistent set of actions yeah and if you ask me the best way is again get a trading plan, right? Yeah. A trading plan would tell you how you're going to enter your trades, right? The trading plan will tell you where to exit, how much you're going to risk. Everything is is black and white. So what you once you have it, just print it out, put it in front of your monitor and just follow it every day. And again, right, if there are days whereby there's no trade, so be it, right? The thing is that you want to follow your trading plan, right? You want to be uh, consistent with your actions, which lead into a consistent set of results, which in them hope, hope for you to be a consistently profitable trader. Yeah, well said, yeah. And so what about yourself? So, you know, trading in many ways, and it may be less so, maybe I'll, I'll get your opinion about this, but um, obviously intraday trading is, is a lot about, you know, it's, it's a very much a performance activity. Um, do you find that trading on the higher time frames, do you still have to have that same level of focus, intensity, you know, same level of discipline, if you want to put it that way, um, as trading at the lower levels? Or do you need to bring that out in yourself when you, you know, show up every day? When you look at the screens, or is it a different level of intensity that you need to that you bring to that you bring to trading? Yeah, I would say that the level of in- intensity is different from someone who's trading a lower time frame and someone who's trading the higher time frame. Yeah. For the higher time frame, you have more time to prepare, you have more time to analyze, you have more time to really think about what you're going to do. Whereas the lower time frame, right? Sometimes things happen so fast is whereby you know if you don't click right now, you're going to miss the trade. So it is much definitely much more intense on the the lower time frame, if you ask me. Yeah. And so I think that's, you know, a good cue for like, so, you know, if you're listening, you're like, well, I don't know which time frame is best for me, right? Th- these are begin you know, these are some cues, right? Like, do you, do you function in a, in a fairly intense environment? Uh, if you struggle, right? Like, if you don't have the energy or the focus or the mental capacity to, to, to have a, a long attention span for a long duration of time, then trading at the lower intervals can be a very, you know, challenging endeavor. Maybe yes, you need to, yeah, just take a step up a bit, maybe to swing or to a longer time frame. Um, yes, that's true. That. And maybe another thing I would like to add is again, it really depends on your your lifestyle, right? Yeah. If you have you have a full time job, right, it does not make sense to be to be day trading or scalping, right? It, it just does not adds up. Yeah. If you have a full time job, you're better off, you know, trading the higher time frames, whereby you can you know still function well at your job and you still can manage your trading. Yeah. So again, lifestyle plays a big part. Yeah. And what about um? What are your thoughts? I know you know, you've re- you've written a number of articles around this stuff, but um. You know what have what are your some of your ideas around you know managing emotions? You know a lot of traders they kind of have a love hate with their emotions <laughs> as it pertains to trading. They love it when they're winning, but <laughs> but when when they're losing, their emotions turn on them, and they have issues with you know self control and and uh, those types of things. So uh, what are your thoughts around you know how traders should best handle their uh, kind of the emotional ups and downs of trading? Okay, I find that there is really no one size fits all because different traders just have different ways of, you know, coping with stress and, you know, drawdowns. 
But for me, I would say the best way to start is again, start small, right? Because when you are starting off your trading career, your goal is not to make a lot of money. Your goal is simply not to lose money. That is it, right? You're not even trying to make money in the first year or second year. Your, your goal is just, you know, to focus on a process, focus on, you know, getting your actions right. So if you know that in the first, second year, the first or one or two years, you are going to be as bad as a trader you can be, <laughs> right. then it makes sense to trade as small as possible because you're going to make so many mistakes. Why would you want to trade, you know, one lot, 10 lot, when the same lessons of these mistakes could cost you just, you know, a fraction of it by trading one mini lot, one micro lot, I don't know. So yeah. I would say trade small in the beginning. And when you have shown the consistency, then it makes sense to scale up gradually, right? I would say a lot of times the emotions come in and it's unnecessary is because number one, unrealistic expectations of what trading is it is, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know they thought they can you know quit their job, you know, live on the beach, you know, trade from there and make their money <laughs> again. Right. And then they, they, the kind of size they put on just does not have any respect for risk. So that's one. That's how they are, you know, emotions get out of sync. And the second way, second, second way they you know the emotions get out of sync is because they are from a one lot trader, they go up to a 20 lot trader. The jump is way too big. Mm. You gotta progressively go up one lot, maybe put on to two lots, two lot you try three, three you okay, you go four, five, you progressively go up the ladder. Right? It's no point trying to see other traders doing 20 lot and you're doing one lot and you're asking why am I doing one lot? But you have to understand the, that trader could be there for the last you know 10 years right. and you're here for just the last 10 weeks. Of course you cannot put yourself in their position, right? They have been through so much more than you. So I'll say this will definitely help with your emotions if you have the right expectations towards trading and you gradually scale up your size instead of you know one lot going to 20 lots. Yeah, that's great advice. Expectations, is, is, that's what I'm hearing from you is the expectations is can can really skew your skew you know what you're doing it's it can put you in the wrong mindset if you're judging yourself against other people um improperly at the same time like you said when you first begin you should have very low expectations <laughs> of your trading um, yes and not believe you're going to quit your job right away and and become the next buffett or <laughs> whoever paul <laughs> tudor jones um so, so let me ask you this so where do you stand in between you know if let's say you're a new trader um are you in the camp that says, all right, you sh you should trade with real money so you can feel what it's like to trade? Or do you think uh, people should start with paper, you know, or SIM trading and then work the way up to, uh, to, uh, to you know, real money? What's your, what's your approach? Okay, for me, I would say demo is good to just understand the platform to buy, sell orders and stuff. And once you have understand, you know, how your platform works, go ahead and move on to real money. Yeah. And again, I would say because these days, right, the, the platforms, the brokers, they are so so-called, what do you call, efficient right now. You can even trade, I think, what, uh, a nano size? Right? I've, mm -hmm. I've never heard of such term before. Right? Nano size, whereby you can risk, I think, one cent or few cents a pip. Yeah. So again, it, it is real money, but it's very insignificant. It's not going to cause damage to your financial well-being. Right. So I would say, right, once you have understood the functions of your platform, trade with real money, but trade really, really small. Right? I would advise if, say, you have $10,000 in risk capital, right? I would say put 50% in the bank. Don't, don't touch it, right? Because, you know, you don't want to lose everything. Yeah. And the remaining 50%, right? You can maybe fund with your trading account and each trade, you risk 1%. So 1% of $5,000 will be $50 on each trade. Yeah. So they are, it's pretty small size, right? But it's, again, enough for you to concern yourself with what you're doing because there is money on the line. And again, it's not too big that will cause you to lose sleep or cause you to, to you know, mortgage your house or, you know, not mm. pay the bills, etc. So I'll yeah. say this is a, it's a good way to move forward. Yeah, yeah I'm a, I, f I fall in the same camp because the worst thing you want to be doing, especially if you're you know, starting out, is to, to cause some sort of unnecessary trauma for yourself because then you're just going to have to dig yourself out of that traumatic hole, which can take you years if, <laughs> if you know, you've, you've you know, traumatized yourself too much from some, some unnecessary losses. Yes, so, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great piece of advice. So that's, uh, let me ask you a couple more questions. So what would you give in terms of a piece of advice let's say you know a trader has been doing well for a while now um and they really want to you know like to say go from from good to great so things are going really well but they really want to begin to push their edges and see what they're really capable of doing do you have any ideas for that type of trader who's like you know what i, I think i'm there now but i really i want to take it to the next level where are the kind of the small edges that they can focus on do you have any ideas about that Okay, first of, all, first of all, I won't even claim that I'm a great trader, but again, let me try to answer this question. So for me, for me, I started off bad because I was all over the place. I was mm. trying, you know, trading trade candlestick, trading indicators, trading chart patterns, and I got nowhere. So when I finally settled on one thing, for example, right now it's trend following, right? Yeah. So at this point in time, every trading method has their own 
pros and cons. For example, trend following, right? Even though it's, it's widely used by the hedge funds and you know, some of the really famous traders, the downside is that periods of non-trending market, right? You could lose quite a bit in the drawdown mm -hmm. or you possibly have no trades at all. So that's it. I would say once you understand your method inside out and you know the flaws that comes with it, for example, trend following, an alternative solution is to come up with another trading method that could complement the weakness of this method. So say, for example, trend following in, in markets of non-trending period, this is where swing traders would try because the swings, you know, they can capture swings even yeah. though there is no trend. So once you've really got good at trend following, then it makes sense to branch up into another method to complement the weakness of your first method. So for me right now, I know the weakness of trend following and markets which are, you know, the markets are not trending. I could adopt a swing trading approach to capture swings in the market. So again, this help with, helps with your overall P&L because you're not just entirely reliant on one method when the, when the conditions are not favorable yeah. for it. So I'll say this is where traders go from, you know, good to great, if you ask me, where they are really flexible. They're not just glued to one approach because they can really bend with the wind, right? If the markets does this, they have certain techniques to handle it. If the market does that, right, they have another set of techniques to, to handle it. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's that's a great answer. So maybe just a couple more questions, and um, we'll begin to wrap things up. So, uh, so just outside of trading for a second, and it sounds like you know because you you mostly trade trade on the higher time frames, it gives you some uh, some extra time to do things. What do you do for fun when you're not trading? Uh, what are your hobbies and things that you like to enjoy in between taking trades? Okay, so uh, I I hit the gym regularly about you know one three five seven. So I, I would say that is the biggest one that I enjoy doing because it kind of just take your way away from trading, nice. away from the the hustle and bustle of life, and just focus on you know yourself, right? Yeah. And yeah, just lifting weights. Nice man, nice. And um, so so here's another fun one. If you weren't trading, what would you be doing? If I weren't trading, what would I be doing? Yeah, if you, if you, oh, did, if you found uh, one day that, you know what, trading is uh, not for me any longer, if, if that would ever happen, but uh, what, what, what else do you think you would be do, interested in doing? Okay, well, I have a, a, a daughter coming in, so maybe I'll be you know, a full-time dad and my wife can work and support me. <laughs> <laughs> like, congratulations, by the way. <laughs> cool. So, um, um, you know, it's, it sounds like, and we talked before the 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 recording started but you're working on some interesting projects but uh it sounds like you know since you're you do a lot of writing um do you have any top recommended books that you often recommend to traders whether they're you know trading related or not do you have any top books that you like to recommend or, or have you know real fondness for okay sure uh i would say again reminiscence of a stock operator is of definitely the number mm. one book and the reason why it's number one is because it can appeal to traders of different stages. Trader where a newbie, you will learn certain lessons. As you become a more seasoned trader, you learn certain lessons. And as you are a pro trader, again, you learn certain lessons. So that book is, is pretty timeless if you ask me, right? Yeah. Because it really doesn't matter what stage of trading you're at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but for me personally, I, when I started off trading and I read the book, I was pretty lost because of the terminology that would use. So I would say it is suited for traders who uh, have at least some experience already. Yeah, right. And it's a, it's a, it's a very timeless book. Yeah. That, that'll be one. And if they want to learn about trend following, again, go and read Michael Covell's book. I will recommend uh, his Turtle Trader book, yeah. his trend following book, as well as Andreas Kleno. His book is also very good, right? Uh, what's the title? Following the Trend. Mm. Yeah. And in terms of technical analysis, I will recommend the works of Adam Grimes. I believe the book is called The Art and Science of Technical Analysis. Again, it's a, it's a very good book, book on technical analysis because there are a lot of statistical studies that are done behind those chart patterns. So it's not those typical trading chart pattern book whereby, you know, you know, head and shoulders, stuff like that. All these patterns, I would say most of us already know. But what about the, the numbers behind it, yeah. you know, the, the stats behind it that actually prove it works? So I would say that book, right, Adam Grimes, The Art and Science of Technical Analysis is a good book for it. Yeah, I agree. Actually, we, we had Adam on the show here uh, s several episodes back and yeah, we talked about his book and I think it's a, a great book and I ought to recommend it too. So that's a great choice. Yes. And in terms of psychology, I think, uh, what's the guy's name? Douglas? Is it Mark Douglas? Yeah, Mark Douglas. Maybe trading yes. in his own. Yes, that is, a, a, I'd say, one of the best psychology book out there. So that, again, is, is uh, highly recommended. And it's unfortunate that we, we lost him, I think, you know, last year. But right. again, a great book to read for yeah. psychology. And yeah. from, for prop yeah. trading, I would say One Good Trade by Mike Bellafiore. Mm. That is another good book for traders wanting to enter that industry. Yeah. Great titles, man. Thanks for sharing. 
Okay. So, well, uh, let's begin to wrap up, sir. Wrap up here. So, if people have enjoyed our conversation today and they want to read more of your work and stay connected with you, where is the best place people can check you out and, and go and follow you? Okay, I have my my website is tradingwithrainer dot com, and you can just find me down there. All my works, all my thoughts about trading is on the website, and yeah, just go ahead and check it out. Cool. And Rainer, are there any projects you're working on in the near-term future that you want to share with the audience? Or is there anything that you want to share that's on your website that people think would be very cool that you think they should, they should check out? Okay, so on my website, I have a, a section called University, one of the links. I would say you can click on it and there is a wide range of articles and videos that you know could get you up to speed on trading, right? So it doesn't matter whether you're a newbie, you're a break-even trader or you're a seasoned trader. The library of articles is, is catered to really to be for traders of any stage in your trading career. So I would say go for it, have a look at it. And, you know, my hopes is that that trading knowledge base would improve your trading. And it's free, right? I don't charge you a single cent. So just go for it and, you know, let me know how it works out for you. Yeah, it's actually, you know, it's, it's actually, Rain is being very humble. It's actually a very nice, uh, um, very nice uh, categorization of all of his writings and some uh, compilations from other authors. And I think you'll really enjoy it, uh, just checking out that, that really powerful free resource. So let me wrap things up. So I have a question for the audience, and I like to often ask the audience a question. You know, one thing that I gleaned from Rainer's, you know, our conversation, our conversation today with Rainer is you know, just the importance of the trading plan. We've talked about this in other episodes, but I never asked you guys out there. Like, we all know that you're supposed to have a trading plan. Now, is there anyone out there who <laughs> does not have a trading plan? And and if you if you don't have a trading plan, I'm curious why not? Why don't you have one? Because um, we all know we're supposed to have one. But I still find that even if I ask that question, there's always some person says, yeah, I know I should have one, but I actually operate without one. So if you're operating without one, I just want to ask you a question. So what would it take for you to, <laughs> to create a trading plan for yourself? What's holding you back from, from just kind of you know, taking that, that step and just you know, writing out this document to process to document your whole you know, workflow from getting in to getting out to how you're going to manage that trade? Think about that. Or let, you know, drop me a line in the show notes and, and let me know if you have any questions about trade plans and maybe we can uh, get Rainer's feedback on that as well. So, as usual, you can find the show notes, transcripts, and all the resources we talked about today on, on the show by going to thetradingedge.org backslash episode 25. Once again, Rainer, thank you so much for your time today and thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Houston. The pleasure is mine. Awesome. Thank you, man. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.